Hello once again everyone. If you saw my XV11 teardown and repair video, you might remember me mentioning that the batteries in that unit uh, weren't lasting very long because it was used and it would maybe run for about like 15 minutes or so before it would just completely die out and have to return to the base and most of the time it wouldn't even make it back to the base because the battery was so dead it would just kind of like stay where it was and tells you to plug it in. So I had a couple options. I could either buy like the the official um, battery packs which were uh, 3200 uh, milliamp hour battery packs and there was also I think some uh, like third party ones that I found online that were I believe like 3500 milliamp hour and some of the reviews on those were like oh, okay yeah the 3500 milliamp hour batteries like last a little bit longer I think they said the battery would go for like 45 minutes or so before needing to recharge again well I decided, because I kind of like to do things myself, that I would make my own battery packs. And so I did a little research as to what size the batteries inside those packs actually were because I'm not too familiar with all the different battery sizes and all that. And came to find out that they're like two, four thirds AF or something like that. So I went on batteryspace.com where I found some batteries that were slightly bigger than the originals and they were actually 4500 milliamp hour batteries and the price I would have paid for like some of the original battery packs which was about I think like 60 or so I ended up paying like $62 or something like that for 12 individual cells of the 4500 milliamp hour batteries so I, did, I just went ahead and I made my own battery packs I had to recycle a few of the parts from the original battery packs but I mean it wasn't much and uh, these are actually my new battery packs here they're kind of ghetto. <laughs> they're held together by like some clear packing tape, which was uh, thin enough to um, not increase the size by too much, but also thick enough to be pretty sturdy. So they're not going to fall apart. And like I said, I reused some of the parts, like the the um, thermal fuse there. Uh, one of the other fuses that I had in here. This little uh, plastic bracket that helps hold the cable in place and the uh, thermistors in there as well as well as these uh, little black end caps which cover up the nickel strips that are welded onto the battery which uh, brings me to the the next thing is um, how to put them together I could have gotten the batteries with the solder tabs pre-attached but that was going to cost me like 25 cents extra per battery and I could have done that but I didn't know quite yet how the batteries you know were going to be arranged inside because I hadn't taken the original ones apart so I just decided not to not to uh, get the tabs pre um, pre attached, and instead I ordered a little roll of a nickel strip from eBay, which uh, ended up being pretty cheap. It was only like uh, I think it was like less than five bucks. I didn't even use mo a lot of it. I only used like a few pieces. My options were I could either buy like this little piece and use what I needed from it, or buy like a huge roll, which was like forty bucks, which would have kind of defeated the purpose of me making my own battery packs. So I, I did that. I just got the little roll and uh, so then there's the issue of how to physically connect all the batteries to each other and I could have like I said done the uh, solder tabs or like soldered the nickel strip to um, each end of the batteries to the other it's like between batteries or do capacitive welding on the tabs which is uh, actually what I did only problem was I didn't have a capacitive discharge welder and um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with what capacitive discharge welding is but if you're not it's basically where you take a, a large charge which would be stored in a capacitor and you just dump all that energy into like a the two materials so that it basically melts at those points and makes it bond together so not having a capacitive discharge welder <sighs> I had to make one so that's this thing right here it's actually an old um, um, APC uh, Backups 300 uh, UPS which actually has, n n except for the transformer, like really none of the original components. I just used it mostly for the case because it was just like the perfect size and everything. And I ended up making the two probes which are what's used to, to solder the nickel strip onto the battery ends. That's those. Although, because it's two probes and I have to use two hands to hold it together, I needed a diff uh, something else to trigger them with. And the only things I have left uh, free are my feet. So I had to use a, a foot 
um, switch to trigger it whenever I wanted to attach one of the nickel strips to it. And this is actually a, a cheap switch that I got on eBay for a tattoo gun. It's a little a foot switch and you can see there with the fancy holographic sticker, tattoo. Uh, this was only like four bucks, I believe, shipped. So it was pretty inexpensive. So I put this whole thing together and I'm actually gonna be taking this apart and showing uh, how it works. So in case you wanna make your own, you can. So as I was saying with capacitive discharge welding, basically what you have is a large capacitor or a bank of capacitors storing a large enough charge that when you dump it into the materials you're working with, it causes them to heat up enough to melt and bond together. So for example, in this case, I have this uh, little piece of a sheet of a steel and a capacitor here. This is only 4,700 4, uh, microfarads. It uh, charges up at about 15 volts right now. So touching it to the and there, well, basically, well, it didn't stick very well, but it causes the two metals to melt and stick together. So basically that's what's happening here, except with uh, more energy. So then I have my capacitor and my electrodes made, and then obviously I have to have some way to trigger the thing so that it doesn't just discharge all this energy as soon as I attach the electrodes to the material. So there was a few ways to go around doing this, as uh, I have them, um, for example, here. Um, one of the ways that's, which is like probably the most crude of them all is to use a two large copper plates which uh, you would bang together and hoping you don't lose uh, too much energy in the process and you're still able to dump some into the electrodes. Uh, like I said, it's the most crude way of doing it and it would probably require me to have somebody else and some eye protection because dust's probably going to fly everywhere, sparks are going to fly. And it's, uh, yeah. Um, to Neanderthal I would say so we're not going to go there. The next method would have been to use like a MOSFET, uh, actually more likely a bank of MOSFETs because you need to dump well, like several uh, tens uh, and going into the hundreds of amps all at once into this material so that it melts and with this actually would have probably been the best way to, for me to do it because you actually could make it so you have more control over it um, you could do things such as like say like double pulse or whatever at uh, each pulse lasting a certain um, amount of time but then uh, the way I ended up having to do it was to use an SCR which is a silicon controlled rectifier so once this is triggered um, it allows uh, all the energy to go from uh, positive to negative th through the material which then melts the nickel strips to the ends of the battery and obviously to dump all that energy through one of those uh, TO220 monsters or whatever wouldn't have been feasible because the thing probably just exploded. So what I ended up uh, doing was using uh, one of these. It's a little hockey puck uh, SCR and this particular one is rated at 158 amps at 1200 volts and this was uh, more than enough. It, it did pretty well. There's also a few other ones you can get such as uh, this one here which actually kind of looks like a sandwich cookie or a cookie sandwich with the uh, two metal plates on the end and then the white stuff in the middle and but anyways uh, this one I believe was rated at I don't even remember but this one was like I think it was like 1500 amps or so like that or at like 600 volts or something it's a monster but uh, it's bigger than what I needed so I'm not gonna use one of these so just so you can get a better look at these uh, battery packs, uh, the way I put them together is in between these uh, areas where the two adjacent batteries would touch each other, there's a small strip of double-sided tape which uh, helped me to like attach everything and, and hold it in place so it would hold its shape. As you can see, there's another one right here. And that would just uh, help me to shape the batteries the way they're supposed to be to fit in the, the little uh, battery compartments inside the uh, vacuum. Uh, like I said, I had to recycle these uh, fuses and some of these tabs I was actually able to uh, remove carefully from the original battery pack so that I could reuse them. Uh, here I wasn't so lucky so I had to make one. And then uh, little tabs for the ends here for the, the terminals. And if you can look in here, you can see that little thin wires for the thermistry coming up in here. And those actually fit in between uh, the cells right here to monitor the temperature when it's charging to prevent overcharging or explosions or whatever and like as I was saying I just used tape to hold everything else in place and actually it didn't turn out too bad as you can see can't really 
twist them or anything so I'm not worried about these falling apart at all or anything and here actually we have the battery specs you can see metal hydride 4 thirds AF 4500 uh, made in China so as I was saying in order to dump such a huge amount of energy uh, you need something that's going to be able to handle that much power uh, this is actually a, a regulator but it's just yeah, here for reference as a TO220 device and this is the one that I actually used and it, it's um, the same type but it's not the actual one that I'm using inside that welder but as you can see uh, these are actually the terminals like terminal 1 and terminal 2 and over here we actually this is the gate and then this one's a uh, part of the uh, cathode terminal so big uh, chunky device and as I was saying you know there's something like this one this thing here is just the monster it's, it's just huge here's the electrodes I actually made these out of uh, I think it was 8 gauge copper wire used uh, in homes for like grounding and stuff I just cut them down to size and then I stuck one into a drill and then the other one to a file and I filed them down to a point you can see there the, since I've used these they're kind of they're a little raggedy now let me see if I can focus on that yeah see right there they're not very pointy anymore and I actually had a bit of a hard time getting the pressure just right when uh, trying to weld the, the tabs on so it was a little difficult there but I managed to get it uh, the wire here is a four gauge wire and it's uh, held down by these clamps that I actually got at Home Depot they're um, I forgot what they're actually meant for but they have these uh, pieces that actually come out of here and it goes up like that and then it has like a hole I guess so you can attach it to something but I just use these to clamp the wire down onto the the actual um, the copper little bar here so it's uh, they're pretty sturdy not gonna fall apart and on the front of the unit here nothing much exciting I just used a quarter inch uh, headphone jack to attach the plug coming from that foot switch and that just uh, plugs into there like that and the power switch I actually ended up using this LED that's inside here not for indicating that the unit was on but for indicating when the capacitor had reached the voltage that I had it set to because uh, different voltages uh, tend to give me different results on different materials so I made that adjustable even though I, I can't get to it from outside but inside there's actually a little pot that I can adjust so I can uh, turn the voltage up or down depending on what I'm doing but for this I was just uh, going to be using one voltage so I didn't really care too much to have any any way to adjust it for, um, from outside and uh, two holes here for allowing these uh, four gauge cables to come out of the case uh, so as I mentioned uh, before the this uh, actually started off as a, um, a backup uh, a battery backup power supply for a computer and I it, the reason I wanted this was because it was just the right size to fit in this uh, huge capacitor as you can see up here this is the actual capacitor I'm using uh, you can see the SCR in here I uh, reused the transformer from the original supply just because the voltage output was actually kind of what I was looking for so it was perfect so I ended up using that and I had to relocate it because originally it was mounted uh, down here on the bottom and there was actually a circuit board up here at the top where I'm using I actually made this metal plate that's uh, screwed onto the rest of the frame here to hold this capacitor up in place but not just for that but it's also the original circuit board was used as a structural element and actually you know kept this uh, whole thing from twisting so that's why I made th that plate not just uh, for the capacitor but for some structural uh, integrity there uh, the circuit board down here, I made myself. I designed it and then uh, etched it out. It houses the voltage regulator for charging the capacitor, and there's actually also a uh, a little voltage comparator in there that um, measures the the voltage of the capacitor. And then once uh, it reaches a preset voltage on the other pin, then it lights the LED to let you know that it's reached that voltage and it's ready to go. Uh, charging a capacitor this size actually takes a bit of time because of the fact that yeah, I'm not getting a big charge out of this transformer and then the regulator I'm using is only uh, I think it was a 317, an LN 317 regulator so it takes a bit of time and I'll show this uh, circuit board in more detail 
when I start taking it apart some more. So removing the that top plate which uh, holds the capacitor in place, this is what we have. This is the regulator board here and as you can see there's two little tiny adjustment butts in there if I can get this thing to focus. Of course not. Yeah, you can see the those two little blue things in there. One's for adjusting the voltage on the on the main regulator and then the other one's for setting the voltage at which it's ready on the on the comparator. And these two wires here in this uh, little white jacket are actually the ones that go to the SCR. One's the gate and then the other one's just for um, the cathode terminal side of the SCR. These uh, two wires here come from the voltage regulator and they're the ones that actually go to charge the capacitor. The positive of the capacitor actually just goes straight out of the case and it goes to the electrode. The negative is actually the one that goes to the SCR here and it's the one that they get switched when I want to trigger the thing. Uh, these uh, four wires here go to that power switch. Two are for the mains to turn it on and off then the other two are for the LED. There's a little resistor in here, a 5 watt, that I actually kind of had to experiment with a little bit to limit the uh, current to the LM387 because I think these are only rated for like 1.5 amps or so. I don't remember exactly what this one was. But I didn't want to completely short it out when it was charging the capacitor because then it would just kind of shut off and it wouldn't do anything. So I had to experiment with that one a little bit. Uh, I ended up with a... This is a 3.9 ohm resistor and it's enough so that it doesn't uh, short out the output from the regulator but it also allows the capacitor to charge up a little faster than it would with uh, something less. Uh, this one here is uh, with a small heat sink, it's just a 5 volt regulator that I'm using as a reference for the, the comparator here. That's actually an LM3. Tenalum 399 device. I'm sorry, 393. And uh, that's the one that's uh, driving the LED to signal when it's ready. As I said, the transformer actually I kept from the UPS, uh, the original UPS. And I just drilled a couple holes in the back here where the outlets used to be. And that actually just holds the transformer in place with a couple nuts on the back. So that worked out pretty well. I, as you can see, there wasn't really much room inside of the thing for anything else. I had to make this uh, whole bracket assembly here for the SCR to be able to hold the, the terminals on. Because as you can see, there's uh, really no way to attach anything to these things. They have these little dimples on them, but I mean, really, you can't without having something to to hold it to hold pressure against the two sides uh, there's really no other way to to connect anything to it so what I ended up doing is I got this a uh, quarter inch piece of um, seal strip or bar and uh, drilled a couple holes here on the ends I made these uh, out of some really hard material I'm not even sure what it was but I had this stuff laying around that was hard enough to not compress under when you tighten up these nuts and it holds everything together pretty well so nothing here really moves these two screws are the ones that go all the way up there and then these blocks are basically just to insulate the the terminals so that nothing's shorting out the capacitor is a car audio capacitor which I actually got some years ago I just never used it for anything until now I just kind of had it sitting around and it claims it's a 2 farad capacitor but I don't know if I actually trust that that um, amount because it was really cheap. It was only I think like 30 bucks or something like that. I got it on sale. And this is one of those uh, digital capacitors that has this this whole assembly up on top which uh, reads the voltage and you know this would, this would have been like up here like that. And I had to remove this because basically with this it's completely useless for my purposes. It has a relay that actually cuts off when the capacitor reaches a certain voltage so it really wouldn't have done us any good and what we need to do is we need to dump the energy from this 
you know, really fairly quickly and we can't have it getting cut off in the process because that's not going to do us any good. So I just uh, took that off and then attached everything else to the ends as so and with those four gauge uh, connectors going directly into the capacitor because we want as much of that energy to be dumped into the material, you know, as possible. So as I was saying, the way this uh, whole welder works isn't terribly complicated. Basically you just have your transformer here. Uh, you have power coming in for the mains going through that switch. It um, gets stepped down, goes through a diode bridge. Then I have that splitting off into the voltage regulator for the cap and a 5 volt regulator for the comparator. And uh, the comparator also takes the voltage uh, going to the cap so it knows when it's ready. You know, and like I said, this one's adjustable and this one's adjustable. So uh, once uh, the cap reaches the voltage that's set down here, it turns on the ready LED. And from the cap, we're going out to the SCR, and then that goes out to the electrodes. And um, well, I mean, I forgot to add in here that there's the, the trigger going to the SCR, but the trigger basically just uh, applies the voltage from the uh, regulator here to the gate of the SCR, and it just triggers it on. And the way the SCRs work is that once uh, it's triggered on, it continue current continues flowing through it until it 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 reaches like a I guess a low threshold where it just you know shuts off again. So once it's triggered, it dumps all that energy. I'm going to do a little demo here as to how this uh, whole thing works. Um, right now uh, it's off, and uh, the capacitor is being about 2.4 volt, 2.4 almost 5 volts here. I'm going to turn it on and we're going to see that voltage rise uh, on the capacitor until it reaches a certain point and then that LED on the power switch is going to turn on. So like I said it doesn't rise very quick because uh, it is a large capacitor so it takes a bit to charge with that little transformer. If I had something bigger, the uh, transformer that was uh, putting out more current uh, and a better regulator I could get this thing charging up faster. That's at 16 volts there. And uh, the LED's still not on. I don't know why that is. Oh, I guess I must have accidentally tweaked that a little bit when I was messing with it. But there it goes. Now it's at. So I had it set to about 16 volts, and then that that um, LED was supposed to come on. So the unit's on, but as you can see, me touching these electrodes together has uh, no effect on anything. And that's because it's not, it hasn't been triggered. So if I were to, say, attach these to whatever um, I'm trying to spot weld together, you know, I would just, uh, just put them together like that, and then I would hit the trigger with my foot. But obviously uh, nothing's going to happen here, so I'm just going to uh, show you real quick on some material what you would expect to see. Okay so I've got my uh, foot uh, switch on the ground and here I have a small piece of nickel strip that I just cut off and I'm going to place this on this little uh, piece of uh, steel here. Got my two electrodes and you gotta put them a little close together just so you get um, some good energy transfer there. And uh, the tricky thing about this is uh, getting the right amount of pressure takes a little bit of practice this wasn't really a, very much of a straightforward job. I had actually messed with it for a while like on, and practiced on some other older uh, dead batteries just so I could uh, get the right amount of pressure and like distance and all that to make it uh, work the best because some of these welds just came out like super crappy. Uh, if I was applying too much pressure, I didn't get a very good weld and if I wasn't applying enough pressure, I would get a lot of spattering so I had to just kind of work with it and figure out which uh, how much pressure was uh, good for this thing. So I'm going to trigger this and you'll probably move this up a little bit more so you can kind of see it a little better and you're going to see some sparks fly quite literally or at least uh, they should. So here it goes and uh, I'm going to trigger it now with my foot and we saw nothing but as you can see there's two little spots here where it actually um, welded and I'm lifting this up and actually that's uh it's not too bad I can't pull this off so that was actually a pretty good bond on this material there um, you can't really see anything on the opposite side there it didn't really do much but this is actually pretty good 
I wasn't expecting it to do that well, to be honest. But let me show you what would happen if uh, there's not enough pressure on it. So I'm barely just applying any pressure on it right at this moment, and I'm hitting the trigger. Yeah, this is actually kind of making a fool out of me right now. That's actually a pretty good weld as well. So I guess uh, this material might be soft enough to make pretty good welds every time, I guess, because... I'm going to have to pry that off uh, to be able to get it off of there. Let me see if I got something here I can do it with. I'll, I'll use this. Oh man. And actually, that's what you would want to see if you were doing a spot well on a battery that it basically tears off the the material because that's a pretty good bond. So that did surprisingly well. I was actually expecting this to not do so hot, but it did. So that's what you want to see. This is one of the original batteries from the battery packs that I ended up uh, rebuilding. Uh, I'm going to try to do it on this here because I, I noticed that it was a bit trickier to weld onto the ends of the batteries than it was to do for something like that that little metal plate I was just uh, working on so I'm going to repeat the process but this time on this battery and uh, we'll see if we can get some mixed results here so I can demonstrate what I was talking about with the uh, different pressures and uh, and whatnot here so I'm going to put some I'm putting at this moment quite a bit of pressure on these tips here and I'm going to trigger it now and it hit there and uh, I got the positive sticking a little bit but uh, there's two spot welds right there and see how hard it is to pull this off see that wasn't very difficult at all on this one and it actually didn't tear the material so now I'm going to repeat it but I'm not going to put as much pressure on it I'm going to put very light pressure on the tips of the electrodes here and then I'm gonna trigger it. Ah, there we go. That's what I was talking about. As you can see, it just completely burnt through that that strip there. And we got that big uh, spot there on the battery. It didn't actually like make a hole but you can see where it, like all the metal spattered and the the uh, positive kind of got stuck to it but not very bad but yeah that's uh, that's one of the things that happens with these if um, there's not enough pressure particularly when we're working on the battery as we saw on the on that little metal plate it didn't really seem to make much of a difference I'm not exactly sure why but that's what it was so this time I'll try it again but I'm going to put some uh, kind of moderate pressure not as much as I was at first. I'm just gonna uh, do it like slightly less pressure, but uh, uh, slightly less pressure than I was doing at the end there, but more pressure than I was doing the first time around. So, let's see. Or vice versa, sorry. So, there's that. Uh, see, that was a little, well, no, it wasn't. Never mind. It kind of fooled me for a sec there. So this time I'm going to apply some moderate pressure, not as much as at first, but certainly a lot less than that last time, and we'll see how it sticks. I don't know if you saw a little spark there, but that actually might be okay. Let's see how easy it is to pull this off. And eh, it wasn't too bad, but certainly not that great as you can see so it does take some practice to try to get the pressure just right when actually working on these batteries so if you're gonna try something similar I would suggest you know get some old cells or something and just uh, practice on them a bit so you can uh, kinda get the technique right and the amount of pressure right because it's it's not 100% straightforward it's a little tricky get them right and sometimes you might not get 
very good welds like so. So yeah, it takes some practice, but once you get it right, it actually works pretty okay. And actually these didn't turn out so bad. So in the end, uh, this really wasn't the cheapest solution for getting new batteries in that vacuum. But it was actually, you know, kind of fun learning uh, how to do something like this. We got never made a capacitor discharge welding before other than, you know, just <laughs> purposefully shorting out capacitors just to watch the sparks fly. But, you know, this is uh, something more controlled to, for, you know, a specific purpose. And it was to make these batteries. So, I mean, I learned a bit and I guess that's what matters. So, I mean, that was about it. So, if you were kind of wondering about that. So, as always, uh, thanks for watching. If you like this kind of stuff, make sure to thumbs up. Um, you can subscribe if you want to, it's free. And if you have any uh, other questions about this or how I went about uh, making uh, this, uh, anything else I've, I might have uh, talked about that wasn't clear, uh, go ahead and uh, leave it in the comments and I'll try to respond uh, as, soon as, as soon as I can. So um, uh, thanks again. Bye guys.